Hi everyone, here's the book Amis once again. Today I'm reviewing The Leopard, Il Gatto Pardo by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. One of those novels many Italian kids have to read in high school. It's one I've had on my shelf for a very long time and I was waiting to read it because I was kind of sure that I was going to love it and I was not disappointed. Italian literature has a long tradition of writers, including Verga, De Roberto, Pirandello, dealing with Sicily in the 19th century and particularly with the consequences of the shift from um, the feudal society of the Borbone, of the uh, Spanish kings uh, in southern Italy, to the Italian unification with the distance between Sicily and the rest of the country, this so-called southern question, just a tiny bit of context, when Italy was unified in 1861, the nation became aware that uh, different parts of it had evolved different, differently, historically speaking. Some parts were more modern than others. In some parts, people lived in worse uh, living conditions than others. And some people will describe this condition, the way this southern question was handled in very different terms. Some considered the unification almost an act of colon colonialism from uh, northern Italy uh, against southern Italy. Uh, others will point at structural differences in the uh, different parts of Italy that were never really addressed historically and are still to be resolved. It's a huge mess and these novels address the unique and the unique problems of Sicily as a region, as an island, and uh, The Leopard by Tomasi di Lampedusa is possibly the most famous and possibly the very best novel dealing with this specific topic, although I will have to be honest with you, uh, while I am perfectly and fully convinced of Italy's diversity, of the fact that uh, its different components have different problems, have different traditions and different mindsets, and I think that's one of our greatest strengths, in fact. I'm also, while I was reading the book, some of the, um, the quintessential problems of Sicily, most notably this idea that the Sicilian people have this irrational pride that makes, makes them hostile toward change, I think that's something that might actually be shared by the country as a whole. This is not to take anything away from the peculiar history of the island and from its specific situation, but in northern Italy, I'm from Monza, from northern Italy, we have this tendency to look at the problems of the south as if they are theirs alone and kind of their own fault, which is of course complete bullshit, both because they are very much shared by us too, and also because they have very much messy, very fucked up historical origins. So as you read this book, wherever you're from, uh, look for the similarities between the conditions of, the, of Sicily as detailed in the novel and the conditions of your own uh, place in the world, because this tendency to look down on southern Italy from the north, I believe it's widely shared by, say, the north of the world, by wealthier countries, as they look down on uh, struggling ones or emerging ones. Also, this is very much a historical novel set in the Sicily of 1860, largely in the Sicily of 1860 and 1861, at the time of Garibaldi's expedition to the island and of the unification of the country of Italy. Uh, but just as with every historical novel, this is kind of a truism when it comes to historical novels, the novel is as much about the time it is set 1860-61, as it is about the time it was written, namely the Italy of the 1950s. If you're watching this video, you might be familiar with Italian literature. The example that is always given in Italy is that of The Betrothed, I Promessi Sposi by Alessandro Manzoni, possibly the most important Italian novel of the 19th century, which is set in the 17th century, and it's set in Milan under Spanish rule, but it's truly very much about Milan in the 19th 19th century as the city is under Austrian rule. This inevitability is why some scholars claim that historical fiction is a myth, that historical fiction is never really about history, is never really about the Middle Ages or ancient Rome 
or World War II, but it is always only about the time it has been written in. Be that as it may, that's debatable, of course, but Tomasi di Lampedusa is very aware of this fundamental distance, and while the novel is very immersive, and it casts you into this decadent world at the end of the feudal society in, uh, in Sicily, this world of opulent palaces full of beautiful frescoes and glorious art, this world of decadent feasts and balls, at the same time, it through maybe some metaphors, through some comparisons, say, with the world of the 1950s, with the world of planes, the world of uh, bombings, and a world where World War II has happened, through some foreshadowings, it uh, reminds you of that distance, it breaks this illusion of immersion with very beautiful results, with very jarring but very stimulating results, and it helps you, it allows you to see maybe how the world you're living in compares to the one described in the novel. That is especially relevant because the key reflection, possibly the, um, the central reflection in um, the Leopard, is a political one. This novel, reflect, the, the main character in this novel, is a prince, uh, Fabrizio de Salina, who, following the suggestions of his adoptive son Tancredi, decides to embrace the uh, revolutionary forces um, brought, uh, represented most notably by Garibaldi, and to rebel against the Spanish kings in southern Italy and to side with um, the king in Turin with unified Italy, but it doesn't, well, it's pretty explicit that the reasons why they do this is because, as they put it in the novel, everything has to change in order for everything to stay the same. This kind of revolution, the unification of Italy, which uh, was perceived maybe at the time as a, a historical change where the whole society will be swept away and a new, more just society will devolve from that, uh, Fabrizio, the main character, is very aware that this is not going to happen, that the people in power are going to stay in power, that maybe somebody will be sacrificed, maybe some things will have to be given up, maybe some, some new uh, powerful people will emerge from this historical uh, chaos, but eventually things will stay the same, the revolution will be somehow hijacked by power and nothing will truly change. And my god, that's a bleak historical vision. It's dreadfully depressing. And of course, once again, while the book is set in the 19th century, you can very much apply it to the world of the mid-20th century. After World War II, the system had been shaken, a new Italy, the First Republic, had emerged, but the implication, of course, in the novel is that even that hadn't really changed the dynamics of power in the country. That's a very common theme in historical fiction. You find it all the time in the fiction of a writer I speak about very often, one of my favorite writers, Thomas Pynchon. This idea that every revolution is inevitably hijacked by power, you find it in Mason and Dixon, where the ideals of freedom of the American frontier are hijacked by the colonial project, you find it in uh, Vineland, or uh, inherent vice, where the cultural revolution of the 1960s eventually dies out and is corrupted. You find it in Bleeding Edge, with the corruption there of the information revolution of the 90s, of geek culture eventually turning into another form of capitalism, and so on and so forth. The difference, and it's a big difference, is that Pynchon portrays all these failed revolutions as tragedies, as lost opportunities, as historical crimes, whereas Tomasi di Lampedusa portrays these dynamics more like an historical inevitability, more like the way the world works. For that reason, many uh, intellectuals, when the book came out, despised it. The book didn't find a publisher during uh, Tomasi di Lampedusa's life, um, especially many left-wing intellectuals of the time thought this was uh, garbage, basically, and what it is, most definitely, is an incredibly bleak and pessimistic uh, 
uh, novel. The kind of worldview you find in here is Lovecraftian in terms of its pessimism and nihilism. If anything, Fabrizio de Salina says in what is possibly the novel's uh, most quoted passage and reflection is this idea that they, the, the nobility, the old feudal society, they were the leopards, the lions, whereas the people who will take their place are going to be jackals and scavengers. Now, some people might read this as kind of a defense and apology of the old society and Although I should probably not mention this because it's going to influence inevitably your reading of the novel Tomás de Lampedusa was himself a nobleman and a prince, I don't think that's, that the novel can be read in any way as an apology of the nobility. Uh, the book is very clear and very explicit in stating how this class lives in a world that is completely separated from the misery of the, of the real world and for, from everyday concerns. It, it highlights some of the horrible crimes the nobility committed against the people, their perversions, the way they oppressed the masses, for the longest time. Uh, I think that's one, uh, it's a thing you find all the time in historical fiction, this way of um, looking at some of the things that are lost with the passing of history. Uh, in Waverley by Sir Walter Scott, widely considered the first historical novels, one of the first, some people will say that's Castle Recreant by Maria Edgeworth. Can you tell I took a class on this stuff? You probably can. In Waverley, in the afterword, uh, Scott said that the old Scottish society he is portraying, it's fine that it's gone because lots of bad things have gone with it, uh, superstition and prejudice and so on, but at the same time many good things were lost, like hospitality and a commitment to tradition and loyalty and so on and so forth. And I think and I don't see a paradox there in highlighting both the good and the bad that's lost with the passing of history, if not the kind of good paradox that is at the heart of all good fiction. At the same time, while the novel is very clear in highlighting the crimes and the perversions of the nobility, don't, this is not the kind of book that instead shows the common people as wholesome and as genuine and good. Uh, there are some chapters in here dedicated uh, to showing how the common people with their misery and their poverty are every bit as scheming, every bit as self-interested and cruel as the nobility. In fact, there is really no good character in this novel, no entirely positive one. Uh, whereas with lots of realism or naturalism, verismo, call it what you will, with these literary traditions very often they focus on the miserable sides of life, on the misery of the common people, on the horrors of history and of poverty, but at the same time in novels such as uh, Thomas Hardy's Test of the D'Urbervilles or Verga's Himalavoglia. You find some positive characters, some good people. Here that doesn't really happen, but the point is that you still find so much moments of good, so much moment of moments of light, to put it in a sentimental way. Uh, the point is that for all this is a bleak novel and all of its characters are more or less gross and cruel, you still find great beauty in, say, in Fabrizio Salina's fascination with astronomy and with the world of science and with, with his pride in some of the values um, that are represented by his family. You find lots of beauty in the description of a relationship of a, of a young love between two youths even though you're always very aware that this love is also motivated by self-interest and a desire to acquire wealth and move on in the world. You find great beauty in a stuck-up young noblewoman uh, falling in love with a young man and then being, becoming too proud to express her feelings and suffering from it all her life. The point is that Il Gatto Pardo never shies away from very uncomfortable truths and in portraying these characters as incredibly proud and greedy but at the same time as motivated by love more, very often and by positive feelings it makes them very humane and it, it allows you to relate and to sympathize even with rather horrible people. That's the stuff of the very greatest literature and if you add to that that the novel is constantly striking a perfect balance between the basest themes, between discussing these characters, uh, lust and greed and, and gluttony and disgust with other people 
and discussing the loftiest historical um, themes and philosophical ideas, all of this makes the Leopard very much a perfect novel. I loved it all the way through. It's a very bleak novel and because of its ideas, because of its very bleak uh, view on life, very nihilistic view on history, it's not going to be to everyone's taste, but I couldn't recommend it highly enough. If you're Italian, it's a must read. If you're, if you're not Italian, it's still a must read, but you might need to research its historical context a little bit. I myself, even though I, I love history, I'm very interested in history, I had to research some of the events mentioned in here. Unfortunately, I don't think the, uh, well, if you find a good annotated edition, good for you also, let me know in the comments. I don't think the vintage classics edition is uh, annotated and that's probably the one you're going to find um, the um, most easily, especially in the UK. Uh, th this is not going to sound very academic, but I'm assuming you read the novel for pleasure. Uh, before you tackle it, maybe spend some quality time, 5-10 minutes, with the Wikipedia's page on the Italian Risorgimento. Uh, I'll put a link in the description box. What do you think of the Leopard? Did you like it? Did you hate it? If you're Italian, did you read it because your high school um, uh, Italian professor forced you? Did you read it for pleasure? If you are a foreigner, if you're not Italian, if you're editing translation, uh, did, these, did those themes resonate with you? Were you able to understand the historical context? Did you find this land and these different social classes very outlandish? or very understandable and relatable, let me know in the comments below. Thank you as always for watching. Guys, in a second I'll, uh, I'll put links on the screen to some others of my videos and I will see you in the next review. Bye guys.